I'd like to really quickly cover um, some um, uh, some material related to um, those dynamic modeling types, just to talk about when they're best um, when they're best applied. Um, you remember we talked about each of these system dynamics, agent based model, and discrete event modeling, and um, and I'd like to um, oh. Sorry, I'm, I'm actually looking at yesterday's presentation. I have one on trade-offs uh, between these. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm confused. Um, I thought it was this one, but uh, okay, yes. Um, okay. Um, so, okay. Um, oh, man. Um Okay, uh, well, I could do this off the top of my head, but I actually had a bunch of slides, so pardon me as I just uh, go and, uh, here we go, there we go, okay, okay, oh, okay, um, trade-offs and synergies, okay, um, looks like we are, um, we are in a uh, uh, difficult uh, place. Um, here, let's, let's try it. Try it in this one. Um, okay. So um, yesterday I discussed these three three modeling types, um, and uh, I'm going to now uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about when to best use um, uh, each of them. Um, so. Um, there's a set of distinctions for each of these that um, that play a role. One 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 of these sets of distinctions has to do with um, uh, with sort of sets of factors that are inherent in each process. Sort of uh, the whether they're uh, qualitative, they support qualitative or quantitative modeling. Whether they're static or dynamic. Whether they are um, still. Uh, Is he recording? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, uh, whether they're uh, stochastic or deterministic, um, capacity to understand single scenarios versus a range of scenarios, how much computational resources, and we don't have time they require, et cetera. We don't have time to go over all of these. Um, a key distinction is whether the models are aggregate or individual in character. And we talked about those three approaches yesterday. Um, two of them um, are typically applied at an individual level. Um, anyone? Want to proffer which which two? Agent based and discrete event. You're typically following individual patients or people presenting for care, for example. Um, um, whereas uh, system dynamics is very commonly practiced at an aggregate level. There are ex exquisite system dynamics individual based models, so it's not it's not always the case. But this is a very important distinction we're going to come back to. So we saw yesterday, for example, an overall system dynamics uh, model, which was characterized using stocks and flows. We count the number of people in different categories. Um, and um, in this issue of choosing um, choosing the sort of level of the system is, is quite important. Among other things, if we characterize things at an individual level, um, it provides us greater capacity to and to ask about interventions which depend on individual characteristics um, uh, based on um, that individual's age, age range or, or, or a background or socioeconomic status. Uh, it also allows us to ask things based on their history in a key way. For example, how many previous how many episodes of care have they had and what was the most recent one, et cetera. Are they a frequent flyer? That's often a function of of um, those individual characteristics need to be supported by an individual-based model in, in most cases. Um, there are sort of ways of trying to um, uh, trying to sort of uh, navigate within that within an aggregate model, but there's limited amount you can degree to which you can capture heterogeneity, the diversity of the population, in particular people's history. Um, so this choice of aggregate versus individual is a fairly fundamental one. Often, uh, Jeff and I both have impulses to often start with an aggregate model 
We'll start with a sort of rough and ready model because we can put it down very quickly, and then we'll move towards an individual model once we get a sense of where the sensitive areas of the system are, the areas of the system where we need more detail. But if you're very clear about that up front, you have a particular group that's at risk or high risk, and you want to simulate them in great detail, the, the, the best way to do that is to, is to think about an individual level model. For the other portions of your population, you might use an aggregate model. Just counts the number of people in some broad categories. You don't need to go into all the detail you would for that more detail uh, for the for the people of focal interest, the, the groups of focal interest or risk. Okay. Um, uh, so the, the sort of the the trade-offs here, and I apologize for the the formatting. I was planning to present this using uh, PowerPoint, but I had trouble. Um, an aggregate model is frequently easier to construct to calibrate, we'll talk about this, to basically interface, um, it has fewer moving parts and, 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 and less data that's often required. And actually you can formally analyze to understand why it's behaving, although in this audience it's unlikely there's gonna be a need to do that. It's much quicker to simulate, so you can simulate it interactively, which often helps learning quickly. And um, because it's quicker to construct and, and to build, you often have more time to experiment with it early on. The downside of it, it comes in a couple areas. A lot of them have to do with flexibility. It turns out you get boxed in sometimes with aggregate models for looking at the things, the very specific interventions you want to look at. Aggregate models, in the words of Jeff, which are, um, I think, sagacious in this area, um, Jeff once intoned that aggregate models are great for identifying where to intervene, but not typically for getting you all the way to how to intervene. So the how, the, the very specific details, often an individual-based model will get you further closer to where you want to go. The words of Kurt also strike, strike me. Um, uh, Kurt, in a, with, with less sagacious intonement, um, commented that that model that we saw yesterday for, that he built for HQC, do you remember that system dynamics model? It counted the number of people in different categories. How many left without, how many per hour are leaving without being seen? How many people are, are, uh, are triaged but not yet, um, so they've been, uh, they've been registered but they're not yet assessed? Do you remember that model? We had stocks and flows and we altered one and we saw the result. Um, he built that model and then he built an agent-based model um, and, and combined with discrete event, an individual-based model. And what he said is, he, he said, it's a very compelling analogy. He said he felt like <clears throat> he had gone from wandering in sort of a maze of corridors um, where he had to be <clears throat> sort of very specific about where to go to sort of channel his energies based on the constraints. Go down this corridor, go down that corridor. He had a smaller number of choices to where with an individual based model he felt he was running across the field. Um, he had he had no he had very few constraints on what he could do. And so it was much easier for him to do what he needed to do for certain detailed interventions, which he had been working to try to represent. He found that this model got him quite far for early understanding and for understanding some of the dynamics and perhaps for some of the sensitivity and for looking at some certain types of interventions, but it became kind of awkward once he started to represent things. He needed to represent interventions that were more targeted and precise. And, and so for those, he used an, an individual-based uh, model and he was able to very quickly put in place the mechanisms that it eluded him for the aggregate model. Is that fair to say, Kurt? Yeah, um, so uh, individual-based model um, can provide strong support for highly targeted policy planning for very precise types of uh, interventions or changes that you want to represent. You can actually make use of longitudinal data. So if you have data on individual trajectories, episodes of care, um, people's uh, history, as it were, such as we might get out of admin data 
or electronic health records. Individual-based models can make use of this in a way that the cross-sectional depictions of aggregate models, of SD models, can't. Remember we said that with SD models yesterday? If they're aggregate in character, they give you a cross-sectional depiction of the population. They say how many people right now, say, are infected, but they don't tell you how many of those people were infected two weeks ago as well. You can't really talk about, aggregate, about individual trajectories in the way you can with an individual level model. It's cross-sectional information versus longitudinal here. Um, you can capture heterogeneity if you have diverse types, people with multiple comorbid conditions. Individual-based models can be much more flexible. You can be able to capture people with several comorbid conditions without much difficulty in a way that <clears throat> you won't with an aggregate model. It gets very cumbersome with an aggregate model for that. Um, and in general, you can examine finer grain consequences here. And sometimes you can describe things in a, in a simpler fashion at an individual level. Sometimes it's actually simpler uh, at an aggregate level, particularly if your understanding of things at the individual level is limited. In health and healthcare, often we have a lot of individual-based data at our disposal. And while you might start with aggregate models and, and persist with them, for areas where you don't need that level of fine-grained detail, often we find individual-based models are really what you need for, for, for certain common types of, of questions. Jeff, um, am I doing them a disservice here? Do you want to opine on this, and perhaps in tone? Uh, I guess um, no of a matter of debate for really 10 years. And uh, often it's really because the individual space model, in terms of being um, intuitively understandable, is really quite a recent uh, phenomenon. Right. And very good point. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I, I think that this debate has kind of been completely surpassed by the fact that uh, you know, the real element is you have to choose between um, two ways of destruction and choose both. And again, you can choose. Um, uh, choose. It's not a question of uh, either or. Right. Right. Yeah. So, right. It's not. It's not a um, either or. You have to commit to one or commit to the other. It's a flexible boundary. And in our work here, we've really made use of that flexible boundary. And Kurt, in fact, um, uh, did in evolving his. So, you know, here's some key me needs motivating individual-based modeling. If you need to capture people's progression along multiple pathways or agent history or uh, learning by experience or localized perception, um, you're simulating things across networks, and then for aggregate-based uh, modeling as well. I don't want to uh, dwell on this too much because, as we said, a lot of what we're doing now is weaving them together. And really, it's not a question of which do you use, it's what area of your model do you use one versus the other. My impulse and Jeff's impulse are both to start aggregate and then learn from that, just like Kurt did, and and then dive down in detail for those areas of the system where, where it's uh, most important to do so. And you'll see uh, one of the examples that I'll be speaking about in the context of this boot camp, those who are staying for four days, will show that. We have a, and this is perhaps you know worth worth mentioning now, we have a system dynamics model upstream, um, something along these lines, um, a system dynamics model that simulates um, the, the broader population at a, quite an aggregate level. And when people flow down to a certain level of risk, namely become diabetic, they're individuated as agents and these agents are in the population. They can be associated with family networks. They could be associated with GIS locations. They could be uh, they could be associated with uh, aspects of of heterogeneity. And these individuals 
are further progressing through a, a discrete event model with respect to care delivery for them. So respect to various services offered to them, such as when they develop chronic kidney disease dialysis or tr kidney transplant. So here you have these folks sort of uh, proceeding through a DES model of a care process, um, and but there's a broader group in the population that's not simulated at a detail level. These are the non-diabetic people, or might be those who are not yet pre-diabetic. Um, in this case, it's non-diabetic. Um, so this this is an example of a threefold division uh, diabetic. Um, so, so here we have SD, here we have ABM, here we have DES. The DES is wonderful for reasoning about uh, resource dependencies, um, availability of those resources is limiting people's flow. Um, basically, for reasoning about the, the care process side, ABM is for capturing the, the population health context for the, position, for the group at risk and SD for the broader population in a very lightweight way. Very handy division, uh, very effective, very lightweight. It means we don't have to put a huge amount of effort into simulating this population, which is not at a risk level that is 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 um, the center point of our study. So this is for looking at diabetic end stage renal disease, with more of the interest being sort of in this area down. So that's an example of a threefold division um, that plays each each type of modeling to its strength and recognizing that that division can evolve over time. Okay, um, so I don't think I'm going to, to go through this except to say that um, that discrete event modeling is, is very, very convenient for representing um, resource-constrained processes, but it really runs into limitations if you try to scale it to a very large scale. Uh, Jeff, do you want to make a comment on that? I know you've encountered uh, as I have, individuals who have struggled to, to apply DES at the level of a hospital, for example. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, there are more than a thousand emergency department models uh, written up in the literature. Got, I think it's about a thousand in Australia. Um, and the one So those are um, good comments. I think a part of the issue with discrete event modeling for um, using it for the entire hospital is also in terms of the flexibility that's, um, uh, that, that sometimes within the hospital context, in, in point of fact, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility as, for example, which beds do you get from which ward or what have you. And trying to represent, trying to represent the hospital as it is, not as it is in theory or, or 
or you know uh, as it um, as as one might imagine it is uh, is really challenging using traditional discrete event. The the other thing is discrete event modeling tends to very much underplay certain key things that we know in the care context are are quite important um, and that include aspects of agent-agent -agent interaction, the coordination between different care professionals, um, handoffs of information, uh, as well as, well, in cases such as nosocomial infection spread, interactions from a, from a pathogen perspective between, between uh, different patients and patients and caregivers. And, you're just not going to represent all of that in a effectively in a discrete event model in a in a sensible way. Um, you, you want it, that that gets more into the area of agent-based modeling and, and being able to capture these these interactions um, in a uh, in in a flexible fashion, which is is not playing to the strength of discrete event modeling. Is that fair to say, Jeff? Uh, yeah, uh, discrete event modeling really came out of the uh, machine metaphor. Manufacturing. Yeah, manufacturing. Think of the conveyor belt. To me, the two places in an in a hospital you think of the conveyor belt is the operating theatre when the patient is unconscious, <laughs> and the, uh, in some ways you sometimes have to uh, really look at efficient processing in the emergency department. These are by far the two areas you'll find the most successful use of discrete events. Uh, again, this idea of uh, the uh, patient occasionally does wake up and run out the door or does something. So that's uh, when you want to start looking at active behaviour of individuals and all the staff that play up from the patient, uh, you really need that sort of uh, uh, different uh, mechanism. The other thing is that there is no method better than system dynamics to uh, represent really clearly feedback and uh, very difficult to really see those feedback clearly with the other method. Yeah. And we know that's very important when people work hard they get tired and uh, stress and burnout is a huge problem in the health system. And it's very difficult to, to represent uh, uh, them uh, effectively uh, without using hybrid tests. Yeah. yeah, this is something where Jeff and I are, are working on to try to bring out those feedbacks better, but it's something of, of um, certainly central interest when it comes to understanding why things go wrong, why things go off base when it comes to uh, healthcare uh, at times. So anyway, those are some comments on these three methods. Um, uh, the, unfortunately, I can't do it full justice. I, you'll find lectures from me online um, on this issue as well as many, many others where I go into this in more detail and um, certainly no shortage of, of models where I'm walking through some of the issues. You'll also find some extensive coverage by me on hybrid modeling, um, including a whole page I maintain on the subject and uh, many diverse models. Any questions about trade-offs between these methods? I know we've done, as everything in this boot camp, we're having to hit things at a fairly high, high level to just give you the flavor of many of the, uh, the trade-offs here, recognizing that you know, really serious coverage will require uh, some exposure to, among other things, um, uh, some of this material online and, and uh, our August boot camp, et cetera. Any questions related to these types of modeling? Each of them very powerful. Each of them not, not sort of su surpassed by the others, but each of them having a natural domain of application. Questions? Okay. Um, okay, so I think uh, we may go on from, uh, from here. We'll see some additional examples of each of them in the next, uh, the next few days for those who are uh, sticking around. Um, Great. So